especially uh, during the past few days, following, followed by uh, a massive island-wide blackout that we experienced uh, earlier this week. Of course, to discuss these matters, uh, we've got uh, an eminent guest on our show this evening. We've got uh, Dr. Vidura Ralapanava, an energy analyst, uh, also been on our shows before. Uh, good evening, Doctor, and welcome to the show. Good evening. Thank you for having me. Dr. Ralapanava, the question that everybody really has right now is now, we're getting mixed statements on uh, you know, what exactly happened. Uh, people are saying it was a malfunction at the Keravalapitiya power plant. Uh, people are saying it was an issue at the Norochole power plant. Not people, I mean authorities. Uh, but uh, today, a, a proper statement uh, came out from uh, the superintendent of transmissions at the CEB. He said that this was a mistake uh, that happened at the Keravalapitiya power plant, and uh, which led to the subsequent incidents that occurred at uh, the Norochole power plant and so on and so forth that resulted in the country uh, losing power throughout an entire day and uh, for a number of hours in the subsequent days cost the economy of Sri Lanka billions at a time when all of Sri Lanka are recovering from a pandemic, the curfews that have been imposed. I mean, this power cut that was implemented across the country could have been the tipping point for certain businesses that were suffering, that were on the edge of collapse. This would have just tipped them over. Sure. What really happened here? So uh, I think there are four things that we need to put into consideration because it's a sequence of events that happen and we cannot point to one thing and, and, and point to Caravella Pitya as, as the problem. Of course, the, uh, the, the beginning of the sequence of events happened in Caravella Pitya. Um, the grid substation in Caravella Pitya uh, and there was some doing some maintenance work and there was a human error which created the earth fault at the uh, substation. Now, um, I think it's um, quite unfair for us to lay the whole blame of a countrywide blackout and subsequent power cuts onto this human error. And let me explain why this is so. Uh, this type of maintenance is happening at 220 kV um, high uh, tension transmission network. Hmm. Before any um, type of repairs happen here, there has to be a special method statement of what they are going to do, how they are going to do this, what kind of safety precautions are overridden, has to be given to authorities and has to be signed off by multiple people. So the question number one is, has this been done in a proper way? Then the second question is that this particular repair uh, in this type of a critical grid if it's done by electrical supervisor, it has to be supervised at least by two different levels of engineers on site at this point of time this is happening. And, they, and they, there is a sequence of processes. These should be structured processes on how you do, what is the sequence of operation, should be properly documented. Now, if any of these processes are not followed, any of that documentation and following that process is not happened, then you cannot simply blame the electrical superintendent who pressed the switch, everybody who was responsible along the chain of command and who were there also have to be accountable. So this I have to say, you know, it's, I don't think it's appropriate to do that. But uh, let's ask a question because Keravala Pitya, uh, there's a power plant, West Coast power plant, was only generating 130 megawatts at that point of time. Mm. The system had 2,100 uh, megawatts of power at that time, so this represented something like 6% mm. of the total power requirement. In a grid, we have more than 5% spinning reserves. Spinning reserves are machines that are spinning, who can immediately power a very, very short time frame. Backup power. Backup power that comes into the grid. Right. Now, there were about 190 megawatts of backup power in the grid at this point of time. So, 130 should not have been felt at all instead of giving a blackout. So, this was at about 12.35 in the afternoon when the Correct. power cut began. Correct. Correct. So, um, so what, what happened, uh, the, uh, according to what the authorities are saying, 160 milliseconds, within 160 milliseconds this earth fault has been rectified, but by that time 130 megawatts are gone, but this is not a problem, it should have come up balanced. 200 milliseconds subsequently, Norochole plant one drops, uh, uh, trips from something called the earth fault in the bus bar. Now, I cannot find a reason how to relate what happened in Kerala Pitya to what happened in Norochole. I don't know if anybody has come out, we haven't seen any of the reports. Um, because, you know, 
Keralapitiya uh, substation then goes to the next substation is Kotugada, then it's Veyangada, then it's New Chilau. After that it goes to Norachola. So you have to go through all this route to go there. And all of these places have particular safety protocols hmm. that should isolate a problem. Right. Dr. Alapadava, I believe that uh, the general public uh, would find it easier to understand if uh, you moved away from a bit of a technical language sure. and so I'll give you an everyday a example that we would easily understand. Yeah, I'll give you a uh, uh, um, good example. Um, if you have a short in your kitchen, you're, you're using your blender, something happens and there's an electric short. Okay. The blender blows. Now that does not make your whole area power go down by blowing up the transformer. Hmm. Right, you have fuse in your house, you have trip switches, there are breakers in your primary power supply. There is a series of protective equipment that is supposed to stop this. It's like a military, there's a chain of command of uh, safety protocols. Hmm. So, what happened in Keravalapitiya should not have transmitted to Norochole and created a trigger there. Now, but here's another challenge, Norochole plant one tripped. Now in this year, we've hmm. had one unit of Norochole, 300 megawatts, tripping at least five times. A year? In this year, in okay. the, this, this last 10 months, it's more actually in a typical year. And, and, and in, in, in other countries and generally within the profession or the industry of power generation, is this a normal occurrence or is it abnormal? So coal power plants tend to have higher failure rates than this, but our coal plant is a particular anomaly because it's, it's quite uh, famous for its breakdowns. Uh, I remember seeing the last Auditor General's report which gave planted a pretty bleak picture of the, uh, uh, of the power plant. Uh, so, so, you know, um, it, it's, it's got a very spotty track record. Right. right? Uh, but we've had five, five uh, trippings maybe this year. Uh, mm. I think it was about 14 last year. Okay. But we've never had an island-wide power cut because system is resilient enough to take a 300 megawatt deficit mm. and still run. Okay. Uh, what happened this time was that after the unit 1 tripped, we had units 2 and 3 tripping and you had total 900 deficit. Now this of course is too much deficit to the grid, so hmm. the whole thing collapses. But you have to ask a question, after 1 trip, why did 2 and 3 trip? Um, and this actually also raises an energy security question for the country. Hmm. So, um, so that's the uh, second and third events. Now the next question we need to ask is, okay, we had a blackout. Right. Why did it take nine hours to recover? Hmm. And this sh honestly should not have happened. Um, we should have got the system recovered much earlier. Um, one thing I have to tell you about the way our coal plants are designed is that um, the coal plant has things, uh, we call them auxiliaries. There are pumps and uh, fans and other equipment that hmm. is keeping the boiler properly running. Hmm. These are running on grid electricity. So these are these are additional equipment at the power plant that are essential for the power plant to function. Sure, and they keep the boilers from uh, overheating. Exactly, and so on and so they have to keep adding water to the boiler, so that's a boiler feed pump. Right. Now, all of these are running on electricity. The moment grid electricity goes off, hmm. you have a particular problem. Unit one has to shut down immediately if grid electricity goes off. It can maybe hold on for five minutes. Beyond that, it can't. Hmm. Unit two and three go into something called um, uh, sort of a you know, internal regulatory mode where they burn oil instead of coal and mm. generate 30 megawatts each to run this equipment. Right. But this is an unstable condition, you can only run it for about two hours. Right. So if you have an island-wide power cut which lasts for more than two hours, um, all your coal plants have to shut down. And once they shut down, it, you have to wait till they are cooled down, maybe three to four year, uh, days mm. before you start up. And that is why even after the power was restored for the rest of the country, because coal power plants had, could not come in, that 900 megawatt mm. could not come in, we had to have a rolling power cut. Um, unit 1 just came, uh, one unit from Coronel actually came up today, mm. um, so we don't know when the other two units are going to come, but that's what created the rolling power cut otherwise. Now this is a particular situation for coal plants. Now, West Coast Power Plant is an oil-powered combined cycle power plant. Mm. It's also giving about 270 megawatts, same as Norochole. Mm. This was start. This started running 17th evening itself. Right. So this is one reason that coal power probably isn't good for our country's energy grid. 
Um, now CB is talking about building the fourth unit. Now if you had the fourth unit that would have also gone off. Um, we were talking at some point about 500 megawatt Sampur. If you mm -hmm. had it, those would have also gone off because nine hours of power cut, none of the auxiliaries would work. And we would have been even bigger trouble mm -hmm. than this. Right? So, um, so, so there is a fundamental weakness of our grid and the way our coal plants are designed and run, which coupled with the kind of uh, uh, um, the kind of mistakes I would say in the safety protocol. I'm not talking about mistakes of a person, hmm. right? Why did but all the procedure? This, why procedure as well as security device? There are automatic security devices to stop this error from spreading, which have somehow not worked. But of course, this is not the first time that Sri Lanka mm -hmm. has experienced an island-wide blackout. Like you said before, uh, there were two power cuts uh, or island-wide blackouts that occurred in 2016. Mm -hmm. uh, now, since then, there was a committee appointed, similar to uh, the committee that has been appointed. Now, there was a report presented. Uh, given the similarities of these two incidents, at least on the grounds that it was an island-wide blackout, I'm pretty sure the reasons for the island-wide blackout would have been different. Uh, were the recommendations of those committees really implemented by the Ceylon Electricity Board. Sure. So there were two blackouts, island-wide blackouts in 2015, if I remember. 16. 15, 2 and 16, 1. Okay. Um, so the, there was uh, committees, there were multiple committees appointed, but only one committee which was appointed by PUCSL, where some Canadian consultants came and hmm. analyzed it. Yeah, I've seen that report. It's by an organization called Manitoba HVDC Center. Okay. Uh, so they had a sequence of uh, um, uh, findings. Now CEB of course says all of them have been implemented. I'm waiting to see. I think one of the fundamental uh, requirements of a, a, a model to understand how this type of force and security systems has to be done, has to be updated. I don't believe this has happened, but CEB says it. We are waiting to see the report uh, to come out. There was another incident on the 3rd of February of this year where CEB went into a partial blackout, certain areas where power mm. was cut and there was a committee appointed by the ministry secretary. Mm. They gave a report. Now unfortunately, sad to say that the authorities hid the report, they didn't publish it. Okay. I know some of the media institutions like you published it. Mm. I've seen the recommendations. and. They had some damning recommendations on the system control center, which I believe have still not been implemented. Now, what are the recommendations? I'll just highlight some of the recommendations and why it might be pertinent in this instance. Because they said there's poor workflow, uh, weak authority in terms of approval process, lot of manual records and lot of duplicate records and not properly structured process. So the question I have is that... So I Dr. Alpanava, these are similar to what you said before, uh, the, the lacuna in the procedure uh, that has mm -hmm. to be followed at the power stations. Of course, uh, uh, Dr. Alpanava, now we uh, don't really have too much of information regarding the blackouts mm -hmm. that occurred uh, at the beginning of this week. Uh, that, of course, will only be revealed by the committee that has been appointed sure. to investigate uh, the matter and that report will come out uh, in due course. Uh, until all of that, uh, this is all just speculation based on reports that have come out previously, mm -hmm. uh, the experiences that we have had previously. Uh, Doctor, we need to cross over to a short uh, commercial break right now. On the other side of the commercial break, we will continue our discussion, uh, but we will try to focus, Doctor, on uh, the, really the alternative or the answer mm -hmm. to the issues that we are facing right now, because that, at the end of the day, is the only topic that we can conclusively speak about. Uh, with zero speculation. Stay tuned, you're watching Newsline. News First, Newsline.
parliamentary debate on the government policy statement commences. Atas siapa tenne meet ada siapa sahaja depan. Samu ke perempuan raja, raja asal kata disuruh diujana vidri pat kali. Labal menteri beraya u Mahindra Rajapaksha netu mawai. Don't forget India's link to the 13th Amendment when making constitutional changes, says C V Bigneshwaran. 14 ministers have cases filed against them by the High Court. Opposition reveals. Tahu kita kahle, raja mudal, janata tahu kita mudal, awal bawa kita kerapu, mahadi kerana nado tiennya, dah hadir dengan kini kami kabinet tegi. Esial nu mana do, tahu kita raja ing, desa pal na paliga ni mula tak dapu, kisima arti apa nanti boru nabi. Joe Biden vows to end U.S. President Trump's season of darkness. If you entrust me with the presidency, I will draw on the best of us, not the worst. News First, Newsline. Welcome back. You're tuned into Newsline on Election First. If you're joining us just now, we're in discussion with uh, Dr. Vidura Ralapanava, who is an energy expert and analyst uh, also uh, regarding energy-related matters. Uh, doctor, as we promised our viewers uh, before the break, uh, we promised that we will discuss about the solutions uh, that can be put forward really to these blackouts that we are experiencing because as I mentioned at the beginning of the program uh, this blackout that we experienced at the start of the week and the subsequent intermittent power cuts that were experienced in the country could have been the tipping point for certain businesses that were on the verge of collapse especially after the, uh, the three month long curfew that the country experienced uh, the co coronavirus pandemic also that is uh, currently ongoing in Sri Lanka mind you so what really is our way out of this? I know it's not going to be a short-term yes or no answer. It's not going to be a short-term plan. Mm -hmm. But to begin somewhere, where do we start? So I think the government has set a very clear policy. Uh, the president's policy says we should get 80% renewable energy by 2030. Are we on track? No. But it's a, it, well, it's a policy statement. So let, let me uh, give that. And this is uh, reiterated by both the minister and the state minister uh, for renewable energy. Um, the sad thing that we see is that uh, there's only one uh, uh, entity that is not on board with it, and that's the CEB. Now, uh, if you talk to CEB, they are talking about building another coal plant, building uh, three or more gas-powered plants, uh, and little bit of renewables. But these are not consistent with the 80% plan. Now, if you want to do 80% renewable energy, you cannot build even a single more coal plant. Hmm. Okay, a coal plant in the country will add 10% of coal-based power into our grid. So, Dr. Alpadava, right now, how much of renewable energy do we have in our national grid? So, right now, we have 40%, which is primarily hydro, large hydro and mini hydro. Right. Now, if you think about now, we consume about 15,000 gigawatt hours per year. By 2030, it's CB projects that this to be 31%. So, almost so, double almost double but that means is current mini hydro and hydro capacity which is 40 percent now on a good year rain here will come down to 20 percent so that 60 percent addition has to come primarily from other renewable energy sources which is wind and solar hmm. so we are talking about a grid which does not have any more coal which may have at most two gas plants which you know we already have maybe one more new one um, and about 10 gigawatts uh, of solar and wind coupled with some storage like battery storage coming into this is the scenario that we need to build uh, for the future uh, now sadly we now, this is all to meet the president's uh, quota of 80 percent renewable energy by the year 2030 that is mentioned in the manifesto of the president uh, the debates began in parliament today and of course it's uh, highly likely that this uh, policy statement will be passed in parliament sure um, 
and, and one of the things I had to say is that this transition is very consistent with the energy transition that is going, going on globally. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, this year in US, renewable energy now contributes more to the US energy system than coal and this was a coal behemoth. And, right. and um, you know, uh, India, which uh, five years ago had predominantly coal powered energy sector, will have 50 percent, you know, their coal component will go down to 50 percent by 2030. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of transition, it's happening all over the world coal of Europe is uh, uh, shutting down their coal plants. Um, there are nine uh, Latin American and Central American countries who pledge to have 70% renewable energy by 2030 right. already. Um, Australia is going through a fantastic trans transition. Some states in Australia such as South Australia and, uh, has a 100% renewable energy target for 2030. Tasmania has 200% renewable energy target because they want to export 100% out. Right. Um, uh, there are projects going on in Western Australia. There's a $10 billion investment that's come in where they want to set up large solar and battery parks so that they export energy to Indonesia, green, clean energy, to Indonesia and Singapore. So this is the kind of transition that's happening. Now, we of course started our life with 100% renewable energy electrical system because we were 100% fed by hydro, right? right? And throughout the history we have come down. Now, unfortunately CEB doesn't seem to want in to move with the times because the last generation plan they presented to Public Utilities Commission, which is the regulator for approval, hmm. so the renewable energy component, which is about 40% now, reduced to 30% within the next 20 years. So when everybody else in the world is trying to increase their renewable energy component, we have a utility even, and, and this, is, this, this happened this year. But this plan was not approved by the Public Utilities Commission. I understand, but what we are, uh, what my question is that when there is Why are the drafting plans like this? When there is a government policy for 80% renewable energy, how can you present a plan which is not aligned to that? To the this regular. was after the election of President Gotabe Rajapaksa. Definitely. Said. This was given in March this year. Uh, so, Dr. Ralapanava, we've got just a few minutes left uh, in our show. Uh, this is a constant argument that's put forward by, let's call, uh, let's say, uh, proponents of coal power or people who say that we need to retain coal power plants in the country. They say that renewable energy is not as cheap as you suggest and the construction of renewable energy power plants is really not uh, uh, an expense that Sri Lanka can bear right now. Um, can we uh, bear the expense of this oil power? We can't, but we are doing it. Um, so let me just say, globally, solar and wind are the cheapest energy sources any country in the world. Um, you know, roughly, now India solar price is about 230 Indian rupees, which is about 8 rupees a unit. Sri Lankan last tender, wind power tender, private power, small scale tender was 950. Last solar power tender put in Sri Lanka, the lowest price was 9 rupees and we have coal power going up to about 18 rupees and gas power about 15 rupees. So we are definitely significantly cheaper in renewable energy than this. That's number one. Uh, some people ask, can we balance the system, system stability? There are no technical problems that are not resolved with 80% renewable scenario and that's not commercially leveraged in other countries in the world. Like in Australia, battery system, even India has battery systems to support the transition, mm. right? Um, and the prices are coming down. Uh, the, you know, I just give you an example. Uh, Prime Minister Modi came to power in 2016. He said, I'm going to build 100 gigawatts of solar power by 2022. Right. By now, they have built 33 gigawatts. 33 gigawatts are being uh, constructed, now the 33 gigawatts are already tendered, right? right? Because when he came and said, we want to do 100 gigawatts, the Central Electricity Authority did not come and say, oh, no, 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 we don't want to do that, we want to do coal, it's so expensive, nothing. Government policy, get on with the program, we are going to do everything to do this. Only here, and CEB is a very unique institution because whatever policy we put, they go on their way and that cannot happen and that is very, very counterproductive to this country, hmm. right? 
the, the, you know, the, the transition that is going through the energy sector is, is quite interesting because it's like moving from rotary phones to mobile phones. Now, along with mobile phones, from moving so over from uh, real cameras to digital cameras. Well, yeah, but now think about it. Every consumer can become a prosumer that produces. Now, I'll give you a good example. Sri Lanka has 22 million people, same as Australia. Hmm. Australia adds over 2 gigawatts of rooftop solar per year. We have 400 for the whole period. That's all. That's our total capacity. Hmm. Same, same population, right? Um, the uh, uh, you know, and, and nothing has happened to their grid. They are doing fantastically well and the states are promoting by giving subsidies. We don't do subsidies to anybody. In India, if you want to put a rooftop solar system, you will get a state subsidy of 70%, up to 70%, depending on which state you are doing. Because they all realize that this is the pathway. Indian strategy, if you look at it, is completely about energy independence through indigenous energy. Hmm. Right? What is our strategy? CB strategy is that we need to bring coal that we don't have, we need to bring gas we don't have, we need to bring oil that we don't have and just send our money, money away. Right? So, so the transition that we are seeing globally is being blocked unfortunately by a utility, by a rogue utility if I want to be very very direct here. Um, the reason to use that word rogue is that why are you not aligned with the policy of the state that is clearly articulated by the minister, hmm. ministry secretary, uh, CEB chairman. Now the funny thing about the CEB chairman is that yesterday I was on a panel with him. He says this is our policy. Then he's talking about building coal and gas, knowing very well these two are not matching. And that right. if uh, coal and gas power plants are constructed even more in the country, we cannot meet the 80% quota by the year 2030 as articulated by the President's policy statement. Correct. Um, but, and Dr. Ralaphanava, unfortunately, we have come to the end of our program today. Of course, this is a topic that can be greatly discussed and is of paramount importance uh, to every citizen of Sri Lanka, as every citizen of Sri Lanka is, co of course, at the end of the day, a consumer of electricity and the power cut that we experience. Uh, would have reminded Sri Lankans of the importance of power and uh, regarding uh, the sufficiency of power in uh, Sri Lanka and how important is it. Of course, uh, we only hope and pray that uh, the President's uh, policy statement uh, uh, is debated in Parliament, it will be passed and it will be implemented mm -hmm. and that we can finally move towards uh, a better, more self-sufficient energy system in the country and we will not experience blackouts like we experienced at the start of this week. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Vidura Ralapanava, for joining us on our show and shedding some insight into these very technical matters, of course. Thank you very much for explaining it in quite a brief manner. I hope uh, the general public watching us, our viewers out there, really understood uh, the gravity of this issue and uh, a little bit of the technicalities as well. Uh, I'm Charlotte Benedict for the News First Team. Thank you very much for tuning in. Of course, we will join you again, same time, same place, on Monday. Take care and God bless. Oh,